Ted, good to see you. Good to meet you face to face. How are you? I am fine, thank you. Appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to me and us at the Historical Games Convention. I'm uh, I'm a big fan, so don't let me sap too much. But I'm just excited that you're here. Well, I always I always used to grouch out uh, Mark's line. If it gets any hotter, I could use a big fan. <laughs> That's priceless. Um, I you know we were uh, talking to the Revolution guys about um, about. Um, the uh, the dark wood, right? The, the deadly woods. Deadly woods. Sorry, deadly woods. Listen to me. Um, so, congratulations on uh, on getting that out. What's uh, what's the thought for going from uh, East Front to North Africa to the Bulge? Um, it just seemed like a topic that would work with with Kit Pull in a, in in a way that. I mean, it's not like there's a tremendous shortage of bulge games. Um, and if I was going to do it, it needed, you know, it needed something different. And I thought kick pull would be that, that difference. That and the fact that um, unlike a lot of bulge games, it's not just the German offensive. It's also the allied, you know, reduction of the bulge. Uh, that's, that's kind of built into the, the game that you're gonna, you know, you don't stop when the Germans can't go any further. You play out the allies having to push them back. What, um, what got you started on, on Dark Valley, the first game in the system? Dark Valley is sort of um, the story of my life <laughs> in a way. <laughs> um, it, 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 I can trace it back to when um, SPI was advertising um, the original War in the East back in 1973. And I ordered it immediately and waited and waited and waited because it didn't come out until mid-74. And, um, and I was disappointed. <laughs> I, I didn't, you know, I didn't hate it, but it wasn't what was in my head. And, um, and that sort of set me out on a uh, search for the ultimate Barbarossa game. And I bought like everything that came out. And I was always, you know, this is, this is nice and this is good and this, but it was never what was in my head. And so sometime back in the late eighties, I said, I think if I'm ever gonna play this game, I'm going to have to make it. And so I, I, that's when I started working on what became, you know, 25, 30 years later, whatever it was, the dark, uh, the dark valley. Um, and uh, right away, the first thing I decided was that it was going to use a chit pull system. I don't remember why I decided that. It's too long ago now. But um, uh, that was that was the original decision. And, um, and I worked on it for a couple of years and got it to where it kind of worked, but it still wasn't what I wanted. And then I had, you know, real life and other stuff and it just got put aside. And then when I started designing, I got, um, you know, I started with World War I and, and all of a sudden I became Mr. World War I. And, and so I didn't get back to it, it just, you know, it's kind of, and at a certain point after, you know, I was with GMT a while and I had done some World War II games. Um, oh, I, I remember now in, in the middle of this, um, I had someone privately offer me some money to design uh, a, a, uh, a East Front game. And I tried to do it for them, but I felt like, why am I designing this game for them when I have this design for me <laughs> that I've been trying to do all these years? So I ended up, I worked on that for like six months and then I had to tell them, thank you, you know, keep your money. I, I, I'm not gonna do this. More time passed, I'm with DMT and eventually I got back to the Dark Valley. And even then it took about three years for me to get it. To where I was like, yeah, this was what I was looking for in 1974. 
and and um, Dark Valley leads to Sands, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's 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 an interesting second choice, right? Um, given given all that's that's uh, that's possible in Europe. Um, how did you know that it would fit the Sands and North African warfare so well? Uh, the short answer to that is I didn't know, but I hoped. Yes. <laughs> um, and and what the reason I chose that was that um, uh, the two areas of World War II that have most always most interested me were the East Front and North Africa. Um, I think because two of my original games in the hobby were Stalingrad and Africa Corps, and probably <laughs> probably it's as simple as that. Right. Uh, um, and it just seemed to me with that kind of back and forth and, you know, trying to get behind the other guy and he's trying to get behind you and, um, that a chip pull should work. And, um, uh, I think it did. I think it turned out pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, speaking of chip pulls generically, one of my favorite games is, uh, is Reds. I love the, uh, you know, chip Chitpool just seems to fit the chaos in that game very well. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm very, you know, I like most of my designs. I'll be honest, I don't like all of them, but I like most of my designs. And um, Reds is one I'm particularly proud of simply because boiling down a conflict with like 27 sides into a two-player game. Yes. You know, I, 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 that was something of a challenge, and I and I think I did okay on that. Yeah, no, you, you did great. It's a, it's it's good fun, and and chaotic is is certainly a uh, a compliment because that's what the what the what the period was. So, um, as it relates to uh, to East Front, um, you'd actually done a famous, at least one famous, well known East Front game, um, Barbar uh, Barbarossa to Berlin before that, right? Which sort of followed off of the passive glory system to a degree it, it's it's not just the east front it's all of world war ii north africa and italy and the western front at, from june, from june 41 yeah um and yeah i mean i i i did not um i mean besides the fact that i've been working you know on my east front game for decades off and on uh, I didn't. I didn't approach the Dark Valley as an East Front version. I had done that, and I had done Stalin's War, and I had done Hitler Turns East for um, ATL Magazine. So, mm -hmm. you know, I already had some East Front uh, credits. Right. Yeah, and that base of research, right? Is yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, um, the, the areas I've read at this point hundreds of books on World War I. Um, but I've also read at this point probably at least 100 books on the East Front in World War II, not, not counting books on World War II in general that include the East Front. So, mm -hmm. you know, I won't say that I'm the world's leading expert, but I certainly know more than uh, a lot of people. <laughs> than most. <laughs> yeah, no question. Well, I want to I want to spend some time on World War One, but but before we before we leave World War Two, um, are are there other applications in World War Two for that whole Dark Valley system? Yeah, I think so. I um, um I mean, the Dark Summer um, people should be getting that literally any day, mm -hmm. um, and um, I have to say, I'm very happy with the way that that turned out. Um, we'll see if we'll see if other people are happy too. <laughs> I'm very happy with the way that turned out. Um, and then you know uh, the Deadly Woods, which is called Deadly simply because GMT asked me to keep dark as a GMT signifier. Right. So the, the Dark Woods originally became the Deadly Woods when I sold it to Revolution. Um, but I have been working on a, um, actually on a Pacific game uh, called the Dark Seas for GMT, which would cover, uh, which would be my kit pull version of, of Mark Herman's car driven Empire of the Sun. Um, and, uh, and then there's certainly, you know, individual campaigns or battles 
that I, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, part of it is that kit pull is an extremely flexible mechanic. It's not one mechanic. It's, there's not one way to use it. The way I've been using it has been to, um, the kits can go from activating everybody to activating just a few people. And you, they can go to activating them just for movement or just for combat or some combination of the two. And they can, and the pool that you're pulling from can vary over the course of the game so that in the Dark Valley, for example, the, the Germans start out, most of the chips, chips in the cup are, are German. And the Russian, you know, when he gets a chance to go, is like, oh, good, I, I, I get to pause being punched for a minute. But at the end of the game, it's the other way around. Most of the chips in the cup are Russian. And the German player is going, can I please pull something to get my guys out of the way? Um, you know, so there's a lot you can do with, with kit pull. It's not one mechanic. It's, it's potentially a whole range of, of different ways to use it. I mean, some people have put in um, random events. And Herman Luttman has put random events into his kit pull, which is a great idea uh, mm -hmm. that I may um, steal, uh, borrow at some point. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's, I don't really see kit pull as being limited to where you can use it. It's a matter of molding it around the topic. Right. Yeah. There's an interesting twist with Herman too, right? You can, um, you can, you can, there, you have to put in a number of random events, but you can pull one of them out, right? You can kind of choose which ones go in and you don't show that to your opponent, right? You don't, which is an interesting twist. I always thought the, the interesting twist that you had in reds is that you, the, whoever has initiative selects the first chit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've used that in, in, I think, all of my chip pull games. Um, uh, just it, it takes a little of the randomness out of it, but more to the point, it gives some benefit to having the initiative. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, of course, you know, it's always a matter of, you know, I choose this for my first kit, and then later on, I'm like, oh, I should have saved that. <laughs> <laughs> To your, to your point about stealing stuff, in my campaigns for 1777, I stole that. Pick the first chit if you have initiative. So thank you for that. You are very welcome. This this hobby is always built on what everyone else is doing. I, <laughs> I, as long as you, you know, acknowledge it. I mean, you know, Paths of Glory, uh, until until Twilight Struggle came along, Paths of Glory was, was number one for quite a while on the, on the BGG war game list. And, um, you know, but, but Paths of Glory only exists because Mark Herman did We the People. Right. Um, you know, I, 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 I played We the People and loved it and, and still love it. It's still, in a way, my favorite quick two-player game. And um, I mean, part of that may be it's one of the rare games I was actually pretty good at playing and sometimes <laughs> actually won. But... Um, you know, and, and I've always acknowledged that. And, and that's what we do. We, you know, we, we, we take from one another. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, I, I like to think of it as collaboration. <laughs> I like to think of it that way too. When the person I'm taking it from thinks of it that way. <laughs> that's right. I didn't ask permission, did I? Yeah. yeah. So true. Um, so the, uh, if we get to a Pacific application, are we going, to, is it, uh, same, same sort of scale as, uh, as Mark's game? Um, yeah, more or less. It's, it's, um, although I have been working with the idea, I've gone back and forth on this of, of, of kind of separating out map scales so that, um, certain parts of the Pacific would have more detailed mini maps you know, um, where a lot of the, you know, like around the Philippines and, you know, around the Solomons and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if that's going to work. I, I, I did a version of it and, and it, it technically it worked, but it was too fiddly. Um, but I may have had, I may have divvied that up into too many different map sections at too many different scales. If, if I, if I take the idea and slim it down, it might still work. 
Yeah, very interesting. So, Ted, who was um, who? Who? What games? You mentioned Stalingrad and Africa Corps, of course. But what what games really had an impact on your perspective on design? Um. Well, I mean, we the people is an obvious one, um, but um, and I and I, I don't like to do this because generally I don't like to be negative about other people's stuff because that I don't like it doesn't mean that other people don't like it and quite rightly so. Um, but I will say that um, for my World War One games, um, Guns of August was kind of a um, the old Avalon Hill Guns of Warriors was kind of a reverse. <laughs> but that, this is what I don't want to do. Right. Uh, design. I, I, I felt like um, it, it, it worked very well on the Western Front, but it sort of reduced every other theater to the Western Front. I mean, it kind of played the same everywhere. And to me, the thing about World War I was it wasn't all three years of trench warfare on the Western Front. You know, there was a lot of other stuff going on that, you know, there was some very mobile campaigns. There was a blitzkrieg through Romania. There was, you know, um, and, and, uh, and I remember when I, I the, the first World War I game I ever designed actually was not the first one published, was the game that became um, When Eagles Fight. And it was originally called Armies of the Czar, and I designed it, and I took it to Avalon Hill. I took it personally. I, I met Don Greenwood at a convention in Baltimore, probably, and I and I said, "Here, you know, think of this as the other East Front," and I and I gave it to him, and he looked at it for five minutes, and said, "World War One doesn't sell," and handed it back to me, and. Um, and I thought as he walked off, well, bad World War I games don't sell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's true. And I think, you know, uh, I agree with your point on not being negative, but Guns of August may have turned many of us against World War I for a long time, right? You know, that's, that's kind of, you know, the way I felt. And, I, and, and, um, and there's still, you know, I'm always, I'm su frankly surprised, but there are people who like it. I, mm -hmm. I, them online saying I'm playing Guns of Oz, one of my favorites. I'm like, good for you. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad you got your money's worth. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you you published Paths of Glory, and and you know, in hindsight, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's one of the top three or one of the top five best selling games for GMT for all time, right? Yeah. So. We, we can't argue, we, we, it would be silly to argue anything other than it's extremely popular and has been for a long time. Um, it's, I think it's number three in the BGG war game list and was no, number one for a long time. It's extraordinary, right? But, but ironically, right? Because, you know, the view on World War I games to that point was they don't sell, you know, people aren't interested, but you just turned all of that um, on its head why do you think that's the case? Well, I mean, I have to give, I was, I think I had some impact before then because I did uh, uh, five World War, I think it was five, maybe four, four or five World War I games for Command Magazine um, before then. And I also did All Quiet on the Western Front for MIH, um, uh, Moments in History um, uh, before then. Um, so I, I, and you know, back then Command had a pretty large um, circulation. Um, so I think, I think there had, I had done something to kind of build an audience before Paths of Glory, who would, who would be willing to give Paths of Glory a look. Um, but I think the thing, I mean, Gene, when Gene agreed to look at Paths of Glory, I'm not sure that he was very excited. But very quickly, he got back in touch with me and like, this is really good. Um, which, of course, I was, I was um, glad to hear. If I can, if I can, little, um, that he got it at all was a matter of, uh, it had originally gone to Avalon Hill just before they went under. In fact, the very last issue of the general announces upcoming game, Paths of Glory. 
Um, and when they were bought by Hasbro, I had to get it back from Hasbro. And the problem wasn't that they weren't willing to give it back. The problem was they didn't know they had it. <laughs> so it took me about six months for them for me to convince them, you have the rights to this. Would you please give them back? To <laughs> and they were finally like, oh, if you say so, fine, it's yours. <laughs> um, so then I offered it to GMT. And, um, but I think the reason this has as much to do with, with the situation as, as my design work, although my design work hopefully brought it out, is that in Paths of Glory, um, both sides, particularly the central powers, but both sides have so many different fronts to balance, so many different, you know, I want to do something on the East front, I need to do something on the West front, but something's happening in the Near East, but wait a minute, Italy just came into the war. Oh yeah, they landed in the Balkans. <laughs> and, and I think that's really, um, you know, the, the the game points out, as I said, that World War I wasn't just trench warfare on the Eastern Front. There's a lot going on. And because of the mechanics of the game, there's a lot more going on than you can deal with at any one moment. And right. that's what give, gives the game its spice, I think. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, you know, as you mentioned, it kind of followed on, uh, followed on, on, uh, Mark Herman's work and car-driven mechanics, right? Yeah, I have to say, um, the only the only car-driven game that I had played, there was there was one or two that came out, at least two that came out between We the People and Paths of Glory, but I hadn't played them. The when I did Paths of Glory, the only one I had played is We the People, um, and and. The basic idea I had in, in We the People, uh, I mean, sorry, in Paths of Glory, was um, in We the People, um, the events were one thing and the operations were another. And, and I put them together. I was not the first to do that, but I did it on my own. It was just, you know, great minds thinking alike or whatever. Um, but, um, uh, and then I thought, well, what else can I put on this card? <laughs> you know, and I was like, you know, because, uh, well, I'll put replacements on. Okay, so now you have three choices. And then I was like, I need some way to get units from one front to another quickly, strategic movement. I'll make that a separate, wait a minute, I can put that on the card too. <laughs> and at some point I decided, um, you know, that I would divvy the decks up between the two sides and then divvy them up further over the course of the war because um, Mark Herman doesn't like that and that's fine. Um, he thinks it's too limiting and it is limiting, but I like it because I'm in it for the narrative, for the story. And it helps make a, a, a more of a narrative out of the game to, to start it, you know, uh, mobilization and go to limited war and then go to total war rather than mixing them all up, um, you know, so that you're playing a, a, a card from 1918 and 1914. Um, you know, Mark deals with that by making his cards in a way generic. The, the title of the card in, in Empire of the Sun is not that actual, you know, is, is, is not what you're actually doing when you play that card, but it's something similar you know, something that would require a similar amount of logistics. When you play one of my cards, that's what you're doing. <laughs> you're doing that thing. And, and, um, and it is more limiting, but at the same time, I think it makes up for that by giving more narrative flavor, or right. at least I hope it does. Right. No, certainly if you play that series of cards that yields the Russian Civil War or the American entry into the, yeah, you, you feel like you've, piece together the, the components, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, and, and it, it's, you know, I think the, um, I mean, that game, I could not play Paths of Glory uh, against one of the sharks now. I just, you know, they would, they would carve me up, <laughs> but they played a major role in, in getting it to the, the deluxe edition and, and, 
refining it and, you know, I mean, anything that could be done with that design at this point, one of them has done it. <laughs> <laughs> because some of them have played the game, you know, 50 times a year for 20 years. I mean, <laughs> right. right, absolutely. Have you ever been to WBC and participated in that, that uh, dance? Early, early on. And, and early on, I could, you know, I could occasionally win. But um, uh, it soon became obvious to me as, as the Sharks refined their game that, you know, uh, so when I went after that, I would just offer myself up as um, if, you know, they had an odd number of people, I would be a willing sacrifice. <laughs> well, it would be a treat to play, uh, play that with you, of course. What, do, do you... Um... It seems like some designers uh, are heavily influenced by the competitive play and, 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 and adjust their game in response to that competitive feedback and others aren't. What, what do you think about that? Um, I mean, I, when a game comes out, there's always gonna be people questioning balance. And sometimes that questioning is justified and sometimes they're just not very good players. Right. And, problem from the designer is it's very hard to know which is the case unless you were there watching them play um and generally what you end up having to do is is wait till there's enough opinion out there you know that you can you can make a judgment and then i'll make changes um uh, dark valley deluxe edition does not have any um does not have any um major rules changes, but it does have tweaks um, in regards to balance um, because people, I, you know, uh, made the point. That was Joanne that just walked by. People, Happy birthday, Joanne. Uh, yeah. People who made the point that, you know, this is a little too hard for the Germans in 1941 and maybe a little, uh, little too hard for the Soviets in 1944. So I made some tweaks and I think it's, I think I took care of those, those issues. Um, so I do pay attention to that, but mostly I'm into the narrative. I'm not, you know, I, when, I, when, when I play a game, I expect to lose. <laughs> I don't always, but I expect to. And, and it's not that I don't want to win. It's just you know, a lot of players are better than me. Um, or I have terrible dice rolling. Isn't that always why we lose? Um, yes, yes. And uh, so I, I um, you know, I, if the game, to me, if you play the game and it tells a good story that held your interest through the entire game, it shouldn't matter that much whether you won or lost. You know, if, if um, you know, I, I mean, obviously I don't want a game where one side has no real chance to win and that comes up, I make changes, but it's not like I'm like trying to get it exactly 50, 50, you know, if it's, they're in the neighborhood, you know, if it's, if it's 60, 40, that's great. You know, I, I have no problem with that. Um, right. Yeah. Balance is an odd concept too, right? I mean, to your point, you don't know when you get the feedback, you don't know the quality of the right. players. But is is balance designed for two exceptional players face to face? Does that is that how we define balance, or do we define it as players playing for the first time against each other? I mean, what's the, how, what does I it mean, all exactly. mean? Exactly. I mean, it means yeah. different things to different people. The the one thing that I think I'm not alone in finding aggravating is the person who um, plays the game. The same two people play the game. And they keep using the same two strategies. They play it the same way each time. And they go, well, I lost every time. And it's like, yeah, but you played it the same way every time. So that doesn't tell me anything, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, there's a, there's a group think that happens in small groups where they play it the same way, right? And, and so, you know, when, uh, it, three or four years ago at our convention here in San Diego, I had a guy walk up to me and, and say, you know, when I play Liberty or Death, the, the, uh, the British can't win. 
And so I walked him across the room to my friend, Michael, who tells me that, that if he plays the British, he can win every time. And I say, you guys hash it out. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And yeah. it's, it's, um, you know, like I said, uh, there are things that you get wrong. There are things that you screwed up. Um, and, yeah. and hopefully they're not major things, but they can still have an effect on balance. Like in the original Paths of Glory, um, it was too easy for the Allies to take Turkey out at Gallipoli. And mm -hmm. for that was there was, a, there was a key card that prevented that. And somehow in playtesting, that card had always come up in time mm -hmm. to be used. But right. as soon as it was out in the real world, it turned out that card doesn't always come up to be used. <laughs> and so I had to make some changes so that you know people weren't knocking Turkey out of the war automatically with Gallipoli all the time. Fine, right. not a you know. I made the change, and it hasn't been a problem since. And yeah. you know, uh, in in the Dark Valley, um, what happened was that um, there's a rule where uh, cities in the Dark Valley for the Russians are treated as towns, much less powerful, unless they get a city defense marker, of which there are only two for the first eight turns. Um, and originally I had those city defense markers coming in in July. And what would happen was they would always get put down in Smolensk and Vitebsk. And that would always throw the Germans off schedule because they were always having to this big battle for, well, I moved it to August. And now the Germans have a realistic chance of, of taking one or both of those cities. And it doesn't always, you know, the same coming to a halt there doesn't happen. And it's a minor change, but it had big effects on, on playback. Sure, sure. Well, that, you know, th these are big, complex systems with a lot of moving pieces, and it's impossible to, to test them all and, uh, and highly likely that there will be a quirk somewhere that someone picks up, yeah. It's, um, you know, uh, but like I said, I don't... Um, I mean, I don't pay attention to people who play the game once and then demand I redesign it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. I, you know, if you want to redesign it, you have it. There's the stuff. Do what you right. want. But I'm not going to. I'm not going to redesign it because you played it once and this, 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 and this. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. And you know, the uh, there's so many different types of players and different personalities, and it, it's just it's hard uh, to to balance and expect there to be a right one correct answer. No, no game is going to appeal to anyone. I don't care if, you know, the, the number one on B, B, BGG. It's somebody it's not going to work for. Likewise, there's almost no game. Like I said, there are people who love Guns of August and good for them. Um, you know, we're a, we're a diverse group. The, the yeah. thing is, it's not like there's only four games out there. And if, you know, and you have to pick from those four. If you don't like X, Try why. There's plenty of games out there. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. Ted, when you when you start down the path of game design, how do you work with a developer? Do you use developers? And and then how do you engage with playtesters? What are your ex expectations and ground rules with playtesters? Well, I generally try and and I don't usually deal with a developer until I have something that I'm ready to put on the P500 if it's GMT or, or something that's basically from my point of view done, where I know all, not that it doesn't need work, but I know all the main mechanics aren't gonna collapse. Yeah. The, 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 the basic engine is solid. Everything else may be a mess, but the basic engine is solid. And at that point, usually what happens is the company finds me a developer. Um, um, and I've had some, Really amazing ones. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, Revolution, Roger Miller did the development on uh, Deadly Woods. So you can't, you know, you can't go better than that. I'm sure, uh, yeah. And, uh, and what happens generally, I mean, it, it varies from company to company and developer to developer. Sometimes I'm very involved. They say, you know, they, they, I, I was very involved. I made sure I was very involved on the Dark Valley since that was my grail game um, where, you know, every question that came up was run by me first and I tried to come up with an answer. I was willing to look at other people's answers, but I, you know, my baby, I wanted to try and come up with an answer. Um, 
other other times, you know, you you hand it in and they say thank you <laughs> and and they, they do what they want with it. Um, um, play testers, I generally don't deal with um, directly, except in the sense of the developer passes on their comments and their their thing. But usually, uh, I leave the developer to wrangle the play testers. Um, in fact, to me, that's that's a large part of the development. I've developed a, a couple of games myself over the years. Uh, I did the original Proud Monster, for example, for Command, and I think um, I think a lot of developing job is playtester wrangling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now you've also dealt with I don't know six or seven different companies as you published your games. Yeah. What, what have you learned about dealing with these different companies and different approaches? Well, uh, with, with one potential exception that I will not go into, um, all the companies that I've dealt with have been, you know, doing their best, good, honest companies doing their best, and I have no complaints. Um, there is a difference in that some companies, like I said, they, they, they take your design and they say, thank you very much. And then you get a copy when it comes out and whatever changes were made were made and that's that. Um, and then there are other companies which basically say, um, you know, we give you the option. You can be involved or we'll, we'll handle it. Like I didn't do a lot with the Deadly Woods, not because I couldn't, Roger kept me informed, but I didn't need to. Roger, you know, knew what he was doing and- yeah, He's a pro, yeah. He's a pro and basically, you know, uh, most of my input consisted of, yeah, that sounds good. Um, <laughs> you know, and then there are cases where I have been, you know, in it up to my elbows right through to, to publication. You know, so, and, and, and I can't always say, you know, it's, it's a funny thing that I have had you know, very often the complaint is, well, this game wasn't developed enough or it wasn't play tested enough. And that's not always the case. I've, I've had cases where games had very little play testing and development and came out and nobody found any real problems and they were just fine. And I've had games that were extensively play tested and developed and had some real problems when they came out. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's not like the amount of, of play testing is a, is a straight translation into no problems. Um, I mean, obviously more play testing is usually better, but it's not a guarantee of anything. So you told me that you're working on something very interesting now. Um, and it's going to take us away from World War One and World War Two to the Nepo Nepole Napoleonic era. Yeah. Um, now it's interesting. I spent the morning talking to Mark McLaughlin about uh, about um, you know War and Peace and uh, the Napoleonic Wars. But um, what's what? What are you thinking about? What's your take on the Napoleonic era? Well, first of all, I'm one of those. I'm not. I'm neither a Napoleon lover or a Napoleon hater. Um, he was, a, you know, he was a man of his time and place, not ours. Um, he wasn't Hitler. He wasn't Stalin. Um, he wasn't fighting democracies. Not even, not even Britain could be described as anything like a democracy at that point. Um, you know, the Tsar of Russia was in, you know, had had, you know, tens of millions of serfs. It's it's not like. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not comparable. People who try and turn Napoleon into the precursor to Hitler or Stalin or whoever, um, yeah, I don't think it works. Um, he left a lot of great things behind. Um, in the end, his ambition or ego got the better of him and he didn't know when to stop. Um, he had offers uh, right up through 1813 to basically let him keep the throne of France and France's natural frontiers. He turned them down or accepted them too late. Um, you know, he was, he was a, a, a very flawed character, but a fascinating one. I, I, I don't think you can look at Napoleon's life and not just be astounded at everything he did in 
you know, uh, in in like 45 years because, you know, the last the last five and a half years he was sitting on an island in the Atlantic. Um, and uh, and so I wanted uh, uh, the inspiration for this was um, uh, Clash of Arms, Legion of Honor. I don't know if you've ever played that. I have not. It's it's basically a it, it, it's a role playing game where you you start out as either a sergeant or a lieutenant in the Revolutionary Armies, and you play through the historical timeline. You get assigned to different armies. You spend time in garrison, gambling and drinking and dueling, and you try and get mistresses and maybe a wife, and and you go on campaigns and you're either brave or cowardly, and if you're cowardly, you're more likely to live, but you're not going to get you know, you're not going to get promoted. Um, and you try and work your way up, maybe, if you're extremely fortunate to be a Marshal of France. And, um, and it's great fun. Um, and originally, I was going to do a naval version for the British Navy. We started out as a midshipman. And, and then I found out that the designer of, of uh, the game was planning to do that himself. And I was like, well, then it's yours. I can't you know, uh, as it turns out, it still hasn't come out. So I, I could have done it, but it's not right. If a designer says I'm working on this using this system, you know, the right thing to do is to say it's yours. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I did. But the idea never entirely, you know, of, of doing a game. And then I thought, why not do it from Napoleon's point of view? Instead of being a sergeant or lieutenant and working your way up, start as, you know, Major Bonaparte, and uh, and work your way up to be emperor. <laughs> I love yeah. it. And uh, so that's what, essentially what it is. It's it's not a war game. I, there's lots of wars in it. <laughs> there are military decisions, um, but it's not a war game. It's a role playing game. It's a solitaire role playing game, which is why it's called I Napoleon. And you start out as you know uh, in 1793. Um, in 1793 and uh you try and work your way up to be emperor you try and remain emperor <laughs> you try i mean the, the basic currency in the game is glory you're trying to gain as much glory as possible um but at the same time there are things uh you need to keep the population of france happy and you track that in terms of um uh there's, there's, well, the game is basically divided into, into two halves. In the first half or the first third, you are a general, hopefully. You work your way up to general. And you're not, you know, you don't run France. So you're not in charge of diplomacy. You're not in charge of, you're not in charge of where you get assigned. Um, that a card decides that. You do have the other cards that allow you influence to say, no, I don't want that. I, I don't want that command. And I'll hope for a better command. Um, but basically, you know, you take what you're given and do the best you can with it and try and build up connections and influence so that you can overthrow the government and become first counsel. And then once you're first counsel, you try and gain enough, you know, glory and political heft that you can say, no, I think I'll be emperor. Um, <laughs> But um, so in the first third or so of the game, there's a lot of stuff you're not dealing with. You're not dealing with diplomacy. You're not dealing with, you know, what choice of campaigns and th things like that. Once you're once and, and you're not dealing with keeping the French population happy. That's not your problem. That's the directory's problem or Robespierre's problem at the start. Um, but once you're first council and, and once you're emperor, then you have to keep the French people happy. And what that involves is every turn you have to roll on a table that will take away glory. And the only way to avoid that is to spend political points to raise the die roll. And political points you have to get from doing certain things or not doing certain things. And the problem is that sometimes the things that help you get political points don't help you with glory. They, they take away glory. And sometimes the things that give you a lot of glory, like winning a military, uh, you know, winning a bloody villain military victory gives you lots of glory. The people at home might not be too thrilled. 
<laughs> so there were, you know, as the game goes on, there are all these things that you have to balance. There are like, there, there's like diplomacy you can use to try and keep, you know, uh, France, uh, to keep uh, Prussia and Russia and Austria uh, neutral or allied. Um, but again, to get those diplomacy points, you have to do things that are going to cost you glory. Well, how much glory am I willing to pay to keep Russia quiet? Right. <laughs> yeah. right. It's uh, it's brilliant. Do you have a publisher for it? GMT. Oh, good. It's it's going to be GMT, and um, um, I don't know if uh, I'm not even sure what the camera is on these things. Uh, but here's. If, if this will show up, this is an example of one of the cards. Oh, that's cool. And and uh, there are 220 cards altogether, um, half of which are after you become emperor. Uh, the first third of which are when you're not yet first council. And then there's uh, another bunch for first council in there. And you know, all kinds of things can happen. You can you can be arrested by Robespierre and executed and have a very short career and start playing again. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can, you know, you can, uh, you can, you know, you can go to Egypt or you can invade Ireland. You can, um, you know, I do have to say that most of the things in the game that can happen actually happened simply because Napoleon had that kind of life where almost everything that could happen, happened. Mm -hmm. But the order that they happen in, the results of their happening, um, those are totally up in the air. And then there are things that never happened that can happen in the game, like invading England or an expedition to Ireland or not, you know, uh, you know, or, you know, so it's not, not causing problems in Spain. Um, uh, now you're almost certainly going to cause problems in Spain because there's so much glory to be had. But <laughs> you know, but you could you could say the hell with that. I'm not going to be Napoleonic. I mean, there are going to be many different levels of of victory conditions. Um, you know, and and one of them is going to be you were a very good ruler, but no Napoleon. <laughs> yeah. um, a, a couple of quick questions uh, from the chat. One is uh, assuming it's a solo game card driven. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. There, there is a board and there is a map on the board, but you don't actually move things around on the map. What you have are, you, you have um, things for keeping track of your glory and political and diplomacy points. And then you have um, uh, boxes on the map for different cards that get, get played. For instance, there's a box for uh, Napoleon himself and certain cards when they're pulled go in that box and you can use them when appropriate. There's there's uh, boxes for Prussia and Russia and Austria as they get commanders pulled out of the deck. They can go in there and they'll be able to use them against you when there's a campaign. Um, there's a box for Napoleon's bed where you put your mistresses. <laughs> um, and mistresses are important for glory, but also because um, if you if you marry a, a woman and she turns out to be barren, to divorce her, you need to first have a bastard child to prove that the problem isn't you. That's curious. So that was uh, that question was from uh, Jay Palarino. The uh, Nuno Nuno Mar Martins is asking. Uh, Will the historical events uh, be as important as uh, Brewery coup be automatic or always happen, or is that a player decision? You have to, I mean, if you don't, if you don't play a coup, um, which I call the Brumaire coup, although, of course, in the game it may happen in a different year or a different month or whatever, but um, uh, if it doesn't happen, you're not going to do very well because... You didn't even become first counsel, so shame on you. That's not very Napoleonic, settling for being a general. Um, but it may not work. You have to, you, you may have the coup and it fails and you're arrested and executed. So <laughs> you, have to, you, have to, you have to put the pieces together. You know, you have to get the support of Talleyrand and Fouché and the Abbe Says. You need to, you know, you need to win victories and, and build up your capital. 
you know, and then when you feel that you have the pieces in play, place, then you go, all right, now I'm going to go for it. Um, and hopefully you've put enough together that it'll work. The problem is that, that you have to do it by 1801, because after that, you're just a general. And, and you know, so there's, there's a time limit on it. And if you wait too long to make sure that it's absolutely certain, it's too late. Mm -hmm. so there's probably going to always be like a, you know, a 10% chance that it's not going to work out. Um, but if it doesn't work out, well, you got that far. That was the story of that Napoleon. Try again. I mean, the whole point of this game is you don't want to play it once. You want to, you know, the idea is, that, or I don't want people to play it once. I want them to experience different Napoleons and different careers, some of which come to a screeching halt early and some of which end with Napoleon dying on the throne <laughs> in 1821. <laughs> So it looks like you're uh, your pre-development stage then if you're with your handwritten cards. Is that the case? I expect uh, to have it ready to hand into Gene um, uh, before my birthday in August. Oh, so, uh, and at that point, they will take up, you know, he's, he's already lining up uh, development. And, and at that point, uh, it will go forward with playtesting. And uh, uh, hopefully... Uh, Hopefully people will like it. I, I'm, I'm quite excited about it. Um, it's, it's something, you know, entirely new for me. And that's, that's a fun thing. Yeah. Um, but it's also everything that I love in the game and that it's, it's narrative. I mean, that's all it is in a way. I mean, you have lots of decisions to make as to, to, you know, choose your own adventure, but, <laughs> and, and things can, can happen randomly that, you know, screw things up for you. Like when you go into a, uh, a campaign in this, you, you put the campaign card down in the current campaign space and you keep drawing cards and, and there are cards that will help you in the campaign. There are cards maybe in your I Napoleon box that will help you um, like Grand Battery say, oh, I'm gonna play my Grand Battery. Um, but there are other cards that are going to hurt you, like um, uh, uh, opposed river crossing. Um, and at a certain point, uh, the year ends, and at that point, you resolve the campaign. And maybe you'll you'll you can win anything from a victory to a bloody victory. Uh, then there's bloody stalemate and stalemate, in which case you can keep trying. Or there's bloody defeat and defeat. So there's a whole range of things that can happen. That's great. Well, what a great place to end it, uh, Ted. Well, also with you disclosing that your birthday is during uh, bloody, uh, the guns of August. So we're, uh, <laughs> we appreciate so much appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and uh, happy birthday to Joanne. I hope you both have a wonderful weekend, but thanks okay. again, Ted. Thank you very much. And um, have a great convention. If I, if I can stop in elsewhere, I will. But if not, um, thank you. And uh, everyone have a great time. Thanks.